uh, a very good evening, friends. I'm absolutely honored and delighted uh, to present to you two very distinguished ladies of immense caliber and talent. Um, I will not take up much time. Uh, author Devika Das will be in conversation with ya Yael Suleiman on her book, The Mind Game. So I'll quickly introduce them and then I will hand it over to Yael to take the conversation forward. I start with Yael Suleiman. She's an author, scholar, and women's rights activist. She currently works as a consultant on gender and development, women of color and reproductive rights, and gender and environmental issues. She's written several books. She's an alumni of Harvard University, and she lives in New York and Kolkata. Thank you, Yael, for being with us today. And we are privileged at the Readers and Writers Club have you with us this evening. Thank you so much, Mona, and thank you, Devika. Thank you so much again. Devika Dar is an award-winning author and actor. She pursues her passion for writing and theater in Hyderabad. Her title, The Mind Game, is a national bestseller and is now available in bookstores in London. She has recently published a Hindi short story titled Meghna, with Blue Rose Publishers. Devika has won the National Award for Short Films, Waterman and the Silent Voice, directed by Anshul Sinha. She has been invited as a speaker for many national literary festivals, TED Circles, and also judged several literary competitions organized by schools and colleges. Currently, she's working as a content strategist for an IT company in Hyderabad. Devika, once again, a very warm welcome to the Readers and Writers Club. And I hope you have a very enlightening and a fruitful uh, conversation with Yael on the mind game. And over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And thank you, Yael, for taking our time for this uh, conversation. I'm looking forward to an enriching and enlightening conversation. Thank you, Devika. Devika, I have a set of questions I've prepared for you. And given the time constraints, we may not be able to cover them all. But I want you to be able to feel comfortable um, responding to the questions as broadly as you can. And if there are things you want to add that may not be in the question, please go ahead and do that. Because you're the author and you're really the queen of this show. I'm just here to assist <laughs> you. So um, let me just start with a very general question which is the title of your book, The Mind Game. So could you maybe share with the people with us today why you chose this title for the book? So uh, the title, The Mind Game, was not a very, uh, not a conscious uh, decision. Like it, it sounded nice and I did not want to make it like, I wanted to write about psychology, but not in, in that um, uh, traditional way of like just giving a lecture on uh, what you should do and what you should not do. So I, I ch chose the title The Mind Game because it plays a, a lot of games. Uh, so I thought let's let's give this this title and this was also selected by the publisher as well. So, so it's actually to give it, tweak it with the fun and enjoyment and the lightness that you want to yes. deliver in terms of the book, in the tone and in the style in which you write, so that it's a fun read for the reader. And um, it's about um, thinking and thoughts and emotions. So yes, the mind game makes a lot of sense. Um, Devika, I read your biography and I'm really happy to meet you in person. But as a theater person, expressing and communicating emotions is integral to your craft. What was the impulse that moved you to write this, would, would I call it a self-help book? Do you think it could be a self-help book? Where the first section is dedicated to mastering one's emotions. Uh, that's a very good question. Thank you so much. And uh, I, would, I would really want to tell all of, uh, all of the people who are listening to us today that we sometimes uh, react rather than responding 
when and uh, uh, we react on impulse and sometimes we also regret our actions later because we say we get too emotional and we 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 are impulsive enough and uh, as you say theater theater has taught me about personality about observing people about uh, not judging people uh, and emotions uh, with every role with every role with every character the emotional graph was different and i understood that there are two basic emotions that that is love and fear every other emotion is just a varying degree a variant of that basic uh, emotion and that is what i wanted people to understand that either if you are feeling positive about yourself you will spread love and if you are feeling negative then you will spread fear so these are the two basic emotions that work and that is that is the the main uh, concept in the first section so basically i think what you're trying to do in the first section is to introduce the readers to these very powerful emotions um which help to define both the person's mood and also gives the situation its aura in a sense and then the, your your emphasis is on how you can control these emotions so that you can optimize your interactions is that would you say your, your yes uh, i would also i would like to add one point also because we sometimes we are not aware about how we are feeling if i ask you how are you feeling today can you can you categorize what are you actually feeling or what are you actually going through so becoming self aware is the first step to to analyze any situation and that is what i have tried from the first section Can you give us an example of a way that one can become self-aware of how you feel? Um, any tip that you can give a reader to to know yourself, which is really a very difficult thing to do. It sounds easy, but it's really difficult, and to gauge your feelings at different moments in time very quickly. In a sense, you have to be able to do that. Yeah. So basically, you have to be present in the in the situation. How I do it is, it it has taken a lot of time to train my mind to think in that way. It has taken a conscious effort of like seven to eight years. When I used to, where I used to uh, look into the mirror, look into into the mirror and ask myself, okay, how are you feeling today? and i was uh, absolutely honest uh, with myself that whatever response i get i will not try to manipulate it if i'm feeling low if i'm feeling bad i will accept it that okay i'm feeling bad but and i would try to find out the reason why i am feeling bad so it is not that uh, the mind game does not tell you to be happy always but it tells you to acknowledge whatever you are feeling because i think we sometimes lie to ourselves and we say that okay everything is going on fine in my in my life when when actually you are going through a turmoil so mm -hmm. and by recognizing that feeling and that emotion how does that put you in the driver's seat so to speak in your interactions with other people it gives me the control to con uh, like it gives me the power to control the situation because if i know what am i feeling like i am talking to you right now i know whether i am actually feeling happy what am what am i going through when i am talking to you i am i am am i the presenting something else on my face and thinking something else like is there a duality or whatever i am thinking in my mind is expressed being expressed on my face so at least uh, that that honesty is there that honesty is and that honest interaction is what you says makes a uh, a trusting relationship uh, a relationship that can be pursued more fully is that correct would that be right Definitely. to say that again definitely because it takes a lot of time to build trust and it is not a it is not a concept of a day or a two but you have to be honest with yourself and honest with the people around you in order to build a trustworthy relationship so the first thing about um being honest is being honest with oneself which is actually taking the time for yourself to acknowledge yeah. what your emotional state is 
and mm. accepting it and moving from there. Yeah. Okay. So now when I read this book of yours, it was clear that you have read widely in psychology. I wanted to ask you who were some of the authors or practitioners that most influenced you, you? and could you name uh, three of them and tell us what critical lessons they taught you or what learnings you gleaned from their writings? Uh, so uh, I have I have been reading psychology since the age of 15. So like from my teens, I have been reading psychology and human behavior. And it was also uh, organizational behavior was one of my subjects in my MBA. Uh, but if you if you ask uh, like for the mind game, not per se, but it, uh, these three books that I'm going to list now, it has uh, had an impact on my life. First one is Alchemist by Paulo Coelho. It it gave me um, a lot of motivation to write about psychology in a simple manner. And because Paulo Coelho has covered a lot of uh, a lot of aspects of psychology in his book, but he has given it in a, in a very lucid manner, and that is what I tried to uh, replicate in my book. The second one is stop worrying. Uh, the second one is stop worrying and start living by Dale Carnegie. Dale Carnegie is a, is an author who has inspired me a lot. I have read a lot of books on on psychology and self help written by Dale Carnegie. Basically, he talks about people management and how can we manage the people around us. But for that, we need to know ourselves first. And that is where that is where the concept of EQ also comes. Emotional quotient also comes. The third one is an Indian uh, an Indian philosopher, Jiddu, uh, J. Krishnamurti, who who started the foundation called uh, Krishnamurti Foundation, Rishivali schools. If uh, Rishivali group of schools, if people have heard, it has been started by Krishnamurti Foundation. And I like the holistic approach that they follow in their school for the all round development of a person. So that that uh, taught me that uh, his books have taught me that you should focus on the all round development of an individual and you should not. OK, all the aspects in your life, be it career, be it academics, be it co-curricular activities, everything has a part to play in your personality development and you should give equal importance to every every activity that happens in your life okay so um it seems that you've read both you know influenced by western um writers and thinkers and as you said the krishnamurti foundation was there anything very different in the approach between the indian uh, psychological writing or and the people from the west what was the basic sort of orientation that may have been different among the two? So uh, in the West, uh, I, I see a lot of the research study is being done in the field of psychology, which is not present that much in India, not to that extent. So uh, due to an extensive uh, research or on field research or the ground level research, I think uh, the approach towards philosophy and uh, human psychology and human behavior is very scientific in nature and even if you see even if you see uh, in uh, through indian writers they also focus on the cultural aspect because india has so much of diversity and uh, indian philosophers and indian indian psychologists also focus on this aspect of uh, cultural diversity that Indians ha Indians have to uh, adapt. Uh, so that is one of the major differences that I found in both their writings. Uh, the Western was more scientific and fact-based. Even Indian is fact-based, but more um, but in, uh, inclined towards cultural aspect. Can you just say a little bit more about Devika? That's very intriguing. When you talk about the diversity of cultures, can you give you an example of how they're able to uh, bring in sort of the incredible diversity of India and use that in their in their writing and in their thinking. Can you give an example of that, maybe? So uh, I cannot quote uh, uh, quote anybody the particularly, but uh, 
on the whole what i have read about indian uh, indian psychologists or indian philosophers is basically like if if you see the culture in the north of india and south of india is diametrically opposite like and if you see the cultural backgrounds and the kind of uh, traditions customs that both the regions follow are very different in nature are very different in nature they have uh, they have a very rational approach as well but like we are uh, like the indians are uh, you can say we believe in god like we have 33 more than 33000 uh, gods different gods and we have a religious uh, religious approach towards philosophy as well i think that is that is one that is one major uh, difference between the western and uh, and the indian philosophy so they take in sort of uh, our notions of the spiritual into their work and their writing yes. which becomes very central in the work yes. of indian philosophers which is not so central which may be more you know scientific or rationally based but the spiritual aspect of us also helps define who we are which is why i think yes. you're saying that the indian philosophers drawing on the western concepts using also our large and rich sp- spiritual heritage are able to give a more comprehensive or holistic um outlook to their work is that correct yes yes that is because because indian philosophers have also focused on finding yourself and exploring your inner core uh, which which is the uh, which is the main main principle of spirituality as well Okay that's very interesting thank you um that is fascinating i was wondering which were some of the indian authors you read because you don't actually discuss them as much in the book and you actually talk more about some of the western learnings um devika when you were writing this book uh it's a very easy to read book it's written in a simple style you said coelho was the person who encouraged you to write in that way in an accessible way because he has huge audiences and you wanted to reach large audiences but all of us when we write i'm a writer too we do have an audience in mind or when we have a theater you know we have an audience in mind it may be a different audience who reads our book but or watches our show we don't expect but we go in with some preconcepts of who is that audience going to be so i was going to ask you when you were writing this book who were you thinking of as your primary readers your primary audiences so this was one of the one of the challenges i faced uh, when i was looking for publishers because defining the target audience was a very, very uh, because this is a kind of a book which which even a teenager can read or even an even an uh, elderly person can also read and both both of them can read because it it is on improvement of yourself uh so uh, so i was it was very difficult for me but uh, during my research i had found that uh, the age group between of 19 to 29 was suffering from depression and at a very high level uh, at a very high level 15 to 25 sorry 15 to 25 uh, was suffering from depression from and the statistics were very disturbing so basically since india is a young country and we have a promising future ahead of us i wanted the youth uh, primarily to read the book because nowadays we are very spoiled for choices we have a lot of options to choose from but we don't know what is right and what is wrong and thus we end up in a there is there is a lot of turbulence in our life because of this confusion so i think and and there are uh, if you if you see the family structure has also evolved earlier we were joint family systems now it it has it is becoming more and more nuclear as people are uh, go, uh, shifting to different uh, cities for work etc uh, so what is happening is people are becoming more uh, aloof or like a little bit confusion is there like what should i do or who am i that question comes at a, at a very early stage nowadays so so those are the uh, those are the people whom i was uh, targeting basically yes yeah, so given that we're such a young you know population you were looking at young people you're saying who um 
who are confused, who may be cut off from joint family, the kinds of supports they had, also with so much internet, with so much communication, so many choices of what to read, where to go, what to look at, it's sometimes hard to define a path for themselves. So you, um, I was reading a very interesting article today in the New York Times, which said the same thing about sexuality and sex, where young people with so many choices, but with no rules and no guidelines, are actually refraining from having sex because it's too confusing right now. So in all aspects of life, young people, you know, seem to have the maximum freedoms, but with that maximum freedoms, without clear guidelines of how to move, it can be very threatening. It can be, they can feel very vulnerable and quite often overwhelmed. And even as a, as a person who's lived through so many changes myself, I'm often also overwhelmed at the array of choices or seeming choices that the market seems yeah. to be throwing at you, which may not even really be that many choices, but you're yeah. left having to select between them. So that's really interesting. Um, so I think the, the book was very straightforward to reach your primary audience, to tell them, you know, what were the most key, um, key ways in which they could live their lives in a simpler, more easy way, feeling more sure of their surroundings, their emotions and their relationships, I think would be the crux of what I read. Would that be correct? Yeah, so basically, see, we uh, if we don't have clarity in life, we will be running aimlessly and running without a direction. And ultimately, that creates a lot of stress and we start panicking. Like, what, what is there? Where are we going? Where are we going? This question can come once or twice in your life, but not every time. Yes, so it shouldn't get, be a daily occurrence. Yeah, <laughs> yes. yeah, it should not be a daily occurrence that what are you doing in life? So okay. you should have some clarity in life because that helps you find the purpose. Uh, otherwise, otherwise, there is like um, there is no definite recipe of success in life. Right. Each person is unique and every person has different goals and responsibilities. You have some responsibilities for the family. You have some responsibilities for yourself. So you have to fulfill those if you want to live, live a satisfied life, if you want contentment. And, so, and you want a good night's sleep, basically. So your book, your, your book is uh, right there. It's very broad in scope. It's got, um, it really covers a gamut of emotions and relationships. I found it very, very wide and far reaching. Uh, so I'm going to ask you if you could just maybe share with people here, maybe five important lessons that you would have liked your um, audiences, your readers to take away from this book, just five. I know there are many more than that, but what do you think are the five most important um, concepts or learnings that you think you would like your readers to take away with them? A very good question. Thank you, Ayal, for asking this. And I would say, I would say that the first one is uh, respond, don't react. Whenever some some problem occurs, or even if you are happy, when you have to take a decision, please respond and don't react impulsively. Don't react on an impulse. So can you can you can you make that can you talk about the difference? That's a very important. Uh, you're you're making a distinction between respond and react. Okay. So, so react, can you define and give an example maybe? Yes. So I I will give my own example. I was very short tempered and I used to get irritated at uh, trivial things. Uh, it used to irritate me a lot, and I I used to fling around things like throw things away when I used to get irritated. Then uh, slowly and steadily, I started focusing on myself. And when I started the self-awareness exercise, I came to know that why it bothers me. What is the actual reason? Why does it bother me? Why do I get irritated so frequently or so quickly? Why, why am I giving the control to somebody else to uh, for my reaction uh, or for my re response, why should other people have the control and why, why can't I gain the control of how, how to lead my life? 
so the, uh, so i i uh, so i i have mentioned an exercise in the book itself that this my mom, grandmother told me that when uh, whenever you get angry start counting backwards from 100 to 1 and i used to see that uh, by the time i reached 95 the cause the reason for the anger used to disappear and i used to be calm so that means we just get irritated simply there is no actual reason why are we getting irritated we get flustered we get flustered and we show a lot of irritation and in that kind of uh, disturbed mindset we we may behave improperly with others around us and it damages it hurts people so from since then i have been consciously uh, aware about what i am feeling how am i responding to people how is my behavior with others because as i say whenever you are talking to somebody keep yourself in other person's shoes and listen to yourself listen to yourself that is the second thing i would tell listen to yourself how do you sound do you sound polite do you sound rude do you sound angry do you sound irritated how do you sound and obviously the behavior that you don't like you should not uh, do the same thing with others so that is that is the second thing i'll, I'll say the third one is be accountable for your own life choices that is one major thing i tell youngster the young students also that okay even if you have made a wrong choice in life it is you who finally decided whether you will do it or not you can't say that somebody manipulated you or somebody influenced you you gave the control of your life to others you were not strong enough that time to take your own decision so accept it accept your vulnerabilities it's fine you you take you take other people's opinions if if you are stuck in a in, in a situation or if you are in a dilemma you talk to people but ultimately the decision is yours what are you going to do nobody can force you nobody can force you at gunpoint and say okay you have to do this but yes life is about choices you make good good choices bad choices and you learn from both so be responsible for whatever you you whatever is your life it is your choice and the next one is don't judge what happens is like i i am meeting you for the first time i'm meeting you for the first time after talking to you in the first instance if i get a good vibe if i feel, feel good after meeting you i will have a positive opinion about you but if I do not get a positive vibe from you, I will think, okay, I don't want to meet this, this person anymore. But we don't, we fail to realize that it was just a chance moment. On this day, on the, at the particular instance when I met you, I may not have been in the right frame of mind. That's why I did not get the right vibe for you, from you. That does not mean you are a bad person. Maybe some other day when we interact, we may gel well or we, we may hit it off well. So we, we, we were very quick in judging others, but I would rather judge myself and not others. How I present myself to others. And what kind, yes. And, and the last one is willingness, willingness to learn as a student. See, nobody knows everything. Even if you reach the age of 70, 75, you have not learned at all. Yes, you might be more experienced than me, but you cannot say that you have learned everything and I don't have anything to learn. If you are free and if you are willing to learn, you will be a happier person because that does not create ego. Okay, these are really important lessons and it seems like the definitions you've given are really 
sort of harking back to the old idea of knowing yourself, um, constantly monitoring your own responses, slowing down, okay, and reflecting on the situation before jumping to a conclusion, uh, giving the other person a chance, and also knowing that your knowledge is always incomplete and that you have something to learn from someone else. So I think those are really important uh, life skills and um, uh, very useful, I'm sure, for young people and, like you say, old people like me. So I'm going to say uh, we've gone through quite a, a bit of, of the book and what you've done. Um, but the second part of your book deals with the concept of reading people, okay? And in your flowing manner, you talk about effective listening and the importance for the listener uh, to listen carefully. And it's also important for the person who's um, sharing, okay? It's, it's a two-way street. Both of them gain something. So can you talk a little bit about this concept of effective listening and what are the benefits that flow for both the speaker and the person who is receiving the information or receiving the intimacy or the sharing? A very good question and uh, thank you for asking it. And I would say that effective listening means that you are present in the moment. Your mind is not distracted. You are paying full attention to what is being said. You want to, you want to participate 100% in the conversation without being bothered by external distractions or internal distractions. So what happens? We sometimes say there is noise in the mind. We writers usually use this uh, expression saying, our mind is cluttered with noise. What is noise? Noise is chaos. When a lot of thoughts are running in our mind, we are not able to be present in the moment. Like suppose I am talking to you. If we don't listen to each other carefully, I will not understand the question that you have asked me. If there is, if I pay attention to what you are saying, it means that I am giving respect to your question. I feel the need of answering the question or I feel the need of participating in the conversation. I give you, I acknowledge that, okay, you have a certain level of knowledge from which you are asking me the question. It is about giving respect and building a certain kind of trust that which is also very important in a relationship. And what I say about effective listening is that if you do not understand when, a, when the other person who is, when the speaker is speaking, if you don't understand, you can ask the speaker to repeat the question. But that will happen only when you are listening. If, if, I, if, I listen to, if I don't listen to your question and start preparing the answer in my mind when you are only halfway through your question, which happens most of the times, you must have heard, met people or engaged in such conversations where you start thinking about the response even before the question is over. What happens is you don't pay attention. That is disrespecting the speaker. And, if you, and if, you want to, if you want to earn respect, you have to give respect first. That's so interesting, uh, Devika. But you know, it's so funny because I remember when I was a young person and I was often interviewed for different issues or the media was interviewing, one of the things we were always told, don't listen to the question just answer what you want to express and tell the audience because anyway, the media is going to have their spin and whatever they want, you have to get your message out. So that's very funny and that's why probably we have so much disrespect for the media and why the media doesn't seem to be speaking to us anymore. And uh, especially in India, I've stopped listening to television 
because um, they don't talk. Everybody screams at each other. And the louder they scream and the, uh, the more they shout, they think they're getting their message across. But for many people, and I think in India, there's sort of a tendency to like a lot of noise. But since I spent many years in the West, it's, I find it so grating that immediately I hear the shrill voices and I switch off. So I think, you know, it, we're living in a society where we know what's the right thing, but all around us, the norms have shifted and changed so much that this sort of mutual respect that you're talking about is hard to be able to share in the yeah. current cultural context. So I think that's really good. And I think there's a difference. You're talking at the personal level, but I think also the social level, we have to learn those norms. And I think um, the way in which media works is teaching people just the opposite. Would you agree? Definitely. I think that is why there is so much of misinformation which is being spread. And we don't know what is right and wrong based on what based on a media report we can't uh, we can't suggest whether it is it is the right thing or the wrong thing and we don't know we we are it's frozen uh, we are so much thank you I, it froze for the minute hey, yeah can you say, Ben, in the media where you were talking about the media and how yeah. it's very difficult to even decipher messages anymore, what is true and what is fake, because we're showered with so much information at such loud decibels that it's even hard to hear each other, leave alone effectively listen, right? Yes, definitely. And, and also, I, I would say that where are we gathering the information from? Like... Uh, it, it is very important to determine the source of information, but we are not taking out that much of time. We are not spending that time to do our research or uh, we are just we are just hearing. We are not listening at all. Yeah, so these are very good lessons. Let me ask you the next question. And I know there's not that much time. We have about 10 or 15 minutes less left you discuss um personality and you discuss behavioral patterns as key to effectively in interact with a range of people can you share some of your insights in how you get a grasp of archetypal personalities that are out there so you have a sense of the personality and you can read them correctly so you can actually engage with them in a constructive way so this does not happen in one communication it it takes a series of communication to understand the true personality of a, an individual so uh, like i i'll just tell you a basic uh, concept that we say if a person is not talking much we say that person is introvert and if a person is like the outgoing type or like a conversation, having conversations, meeting strangers, we say that person is an extrovert. But what we fail to realize is that introvert does not mean that every introvert is shy or hesitates to speak. It is just that they spend like to spend time with themselves. They observe, they observe, and before sharing their opinion, they will they will find a logical conclusion before sharing their response and their their series of their sources of motivation are very personal in nature for example they are engaged in habits like reading listening to music or painting uh, if, if you see an artist um, on uh, like say 95 percent of all the artists are introverts because they like to observe an extrovert will be talkative we like to meet people. They they try to uh, get their motivation from external sources, like from other people, from traveling, from meeting other people, socializing, social networking. That is their external motivation. So basically, we have to understand the motivation of the person. What makes the person uh, engage in a situation? that is very important to understand 
and not just label them that just because they are not talking they are introverts no they are not they might take some time to open up but once they open up you will realize that they have a lot of wisdom and a lot of knowledge <laughs> Yeah. Um, Devika, would you say, I mean, that all of us are both, depending on the situation that we're in? Because I would say I like painting, I like reading, and I like writing. And uh, I need that quiet time and that space for myself to regenerate and be creative. If I want to be creative, I need that space. But when I'm outside and I'm with people, I like to interact. I like to enjoy the dynamism, the energy, learn from people. And uh, I, I do both. So do you think all of us have both those tendencies and just one tends to maybe be more dominant than others depending on our situation? Definitely. We are a mix of both. We are both introverts and extroverts, as you said, depending on situations. Basically, if, 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 I, if I get a good energy, like I am I'm a firm believer of uh, meeting a person and exchanging good energy with that person. If I if I'm getting the good vibes, I will immediately engage in a conversation. But if I am not getting a good vibe, I won't judge the person. But I will take some time to open up and not uh, not be as transparent with the person. Yeah. Okay. So when you say your different personalities and behavior patterns, do you think people need to look out for them? And are there ways for people to decipher? how what type of person they're engaging with are there quick tips that you can give people so one Any one tip uh, one tip will be effective listening is the first one listening uh, uh, not only to the words that are being exchanged but also observe the body language is the person comfortable while talking to you or is the person hesitant these are some of the mannerisms like if i if i if i am uh, if I am doing this while talking, that means I am a bit nervous and I'm not feeling comfortable talking to you. I am a bit hesitant to open up. There are there are a lot of non-verbal signs, signals, which we must observe. Because yes, and in your book you talk a lot about that. You talk yes. about body la body language and how that's sometimes even more important than the words that people say. Definitely, because because sometimes we may be quiet, but but our body expresses much more than our words. So we need to we need to learn the uh, art of nonverbal nonverbal communication as well. Okay, um, the next question I wanted to uh, talk about is. Um, a concept you use, which I loved because I'm an environmentalist too, when you said it's important for us to learn to live better with less, right? And uh, uh, given what's happening environmentally, I think it's really important for everybody to think about what we consume, just generally, materially, and everything else. Um, what do you mean when you talk about the notion of simple living and its benefits in the context of um, learning to live with less? So uh, this is a concept I am practicing uh, in my life as well. Uh, OK, the current generation calls it minimalism. Yes, I have, I have been practicing it from a long time. Like it's been seven to eight years since I have, I'm practicing. And I am, uh, I am focusing on mindful consumption, which is like, OK, just because I have the purchasing power does not mean I will buy stuff which I do not require, actually. Sometimes what happens is we have this guilty pleasure of satisfying our ego. Uh, we'll, we'll just go out shopping and buy stuff, buy stuff which we might use only once in our whole life. But then what do we do? What do we do with that? We can't even dispose it off. And uh, like we know, everybody knows that plastic is harmful. But are we making the choices of not he not keeping plastic at home? Are we making that choices? What are we doing? We know all the problems that environment is facing right now. But what are we doing now to uh, reduce the problems? We are, I don't think so. We are doing. We are contributing much to it. And simple living is basically see. We need our basic needs 
food, clothing, shelter. But how much do we need? How much do we actually need? Are we consuming mindfully? Or are we, are we spendthrifts? Just because we have the purchasing power does not mean you... you I'm not, I'm not against uh, living a luxurious life or anything. I'm not against it. Many people, many people strive to live a luxurious life. And luxury also, the definition of luxury differs from person to person. I'm not asking about life choices. I'm not judging your life choices. What I am saying is, can you justify what you are consuming? Do you have a justification? Basically. But uh, Devika, I read the book carefully and that section two, it was, I think you were doing much more than just talking about the environmental impacts of our choices, but you were talking about also the satisfaction we have inside from mm -hmm. living a simple life. That living a simple life is not only because you're guilty because the environmental implications of your actions, but actually simplifying your life brings more contentment in a sense or did i read that wrong uh no that's absolutely right because see well, as i said we are spoiled for choices now if if i want if i want to order food like if i if i'm not feeling like cooking today i have a swiggy i have a zomato i have different options to order order food from okay now what are the implications of having uh, of having uh, food from outside health implications are there so health may get spoiled may not get spoiled but if health gets spoiled you are disturbing your health you are disturbing your metabolism simple living tells you that cook your food on your own what can you do if you cook your own food you will you will cater to the nutrition level you will cater to the health, the health, uh, what, I, what do you say, nutrition level, the health, um, you will keep a health check. You, you will keep the health benefits in mind. So ultimately, ultimately, this choice may be laborious. You might have to work a little bit for this. But in the long run, this will be beneficial to you. But I think you also talk about this notion, um, you don't use those words, you don't clutter your mind in a way with this constant desire to obtain material goods. And by actually not focusing on constant consumption, you're able to focus on what is really more important, maybe effective listening to the partner in your life or the child you know that you're looking after or the adult or your partner in some way, because your mind is not cluttered with this constant um, need to go after the next object of desire. Was that also part of the message that you were trying to relate? Because that's what I got from it. Yes, basically what happens is, the, like I said, just because you have the money does not mean you buy stuff. What, what uh, indirectly I want to tell is, materialism can satisfy your uh, desires, your um, uh, what do you say? Materialism cannot. Ma materialism, yeah, materialism cannot buy happiness. Happiness, the inner happiness, inner happiness comes with your inner self when you have the peace in mind, peace of mind, and when, like for me, the recipe of life, a uh, simple life, is my life choices should give me a good night's sleep. This is my recipe for a simple life. Um, at, the end, at the end of the day, I should be able to get my full sleep of eight, six to seven hours and without any tension. I do not want to have stress in my life. How okay, do I live that? Just, just a minute, Devika. Mona, are you over there? Um, I was just wondering how we're doing for time. Mona? Um, we, have another, we have another, another, we can take one more question. Yeah. Can you sure. have one last question? And uh, does the audience want to ask any question or should I take the last question, Mona? You can take the last question. 
Okay, so I'm gonna. Um, you were talking about you know sleep and getting that good night's sleep and that peaceful sleep and that inner happiness as well. So the last part of your book, almost the last part, deals with the eternal question that humanity has always pursued: is finding happiness and how do we find happiness? In this brief time, can you discuss your notions of what it means to be happy and maybe three critical tips that you can share? Uh, on how to be happy. Happiness is a state of mind where you feel calm. When you are, your mind is not disturbed, your, your mind is free to wander around. That is happiness. That is the state of happiness. And I, I would also say that when you become so relaxed, when you have a relaxed mind, what I do is I write. Writing gives me a lot of inner peace and happiness. Or uh, I talk to, a, I have a support system. I have, over the years, I have built a support system. It, it is very, uh, it is magical because it is just that I think about the person and the person communicates with me or the person contacts me. It, it is magical. And I never think that I'm spending time. There is a there is a difference between the term spend and invest. I always feel that I am investing time with this with these people because we engage in such conversations which are magical in nature. So I think having a good support system is the second one. And the third one is keep keep your life simple with by having clarity with what are your priorities in life what do you want and are your priorities driven by external factors or do you really want it is it your inner inner calling okay so on that note i think we ran through the gamut of some of the big issues that you talked uh, about in your book and some of the practical tips that you gave us today are very much in the style of your book where in each section you actually number uh, give people very practical tips on how to pursue to meet the objectives that you set out in each section so with that i'll hand over to mona and see if uh, mona would like us to um, say anything else or where we're at with time mona thank you so much to both of you, Yael and Devika, I was listening to your interaction. Let me tell you, like the viewers, I learned so much. Great revelations, great interaction, and a very enlightening discussion. So a huge thank you from the Readers and Writers Club and wishing both of you all the very best in your respective professional and career journeys and all the best and thank you so much thank, thank you so you much Mona. devika thank you mona and thank mona you. and uh, devika really wishing you all the best and i'm now that i read you i also want to see you perform i want next <laughs> time you're in calcutta and you're you're doing a show please let us know we'd like to come thank and you. support you Thank yes, you absolutely. so much. And I would, I would also like to thank Yael for such an enriching session. It has, I have given so many, I have engaged in so many interactions, but this, this was a very in, enriching uh, session. And you really made me think. Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank you so much to both of you. Thank you. Very good evening. Thank you. Bye bye.